Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. So for those who don't know me, I'm a isotope geochemist by training. But today I'm going to share with you some recent results about coral cascation. I work together with my colleague Anne Cohen and Nathan Monica, who is a graduate student, and I co-advise. So as Andrea mentioned in her talk, Ocean education is expected to have a negative impact on coral cascation. The story is very simple, at least in the conventional view, is when seawater pH drops, you decrease in the carbon ion concentration in the seawater, which in turn decreases the omega uh, saturation state of arachnid in the case of coral. Then based on inorganic experiment, we know the precipitating rate of uh, uh, arachnid scale with the omega. Then when basically when ocean acidification happens, you will have a slower precipitation rate of classification. It is projected by the end of this century, the ocean pH will drop by another 0.14 to 2.4 units. If we just extrapolate this uh, rate of kinetics we determine in a particular experiment, then we would expect a 48% drop in the coral classification rate. But is that really the case? The way to find out is to do lab experiment. So I'm showing here uh, two examples where people culture coral in a controlled PCO2 conditions or pH conditions. There are two ways to control the pH of PCO2 in this experiment. One is by simply adding acid. As you know, when you add in the acid, you change the alkalinity. So it's not as uh, similar as uh, what we are experiencing in the real world. So later started, uh, more turn into a way to monitor, control the pH of PCO2 in this experiment by increasing the PCO2, literally. Okay, so, so in this experiment, there has been like numerous experiments have been done. You find all kinds of response. I'm showing here there's two examples. One, you see a decrease of omega as you expected from a the experiment. But for another species, what you see is actually quite different. You don't really see a decrease of incarcation rate with the seawater omega until a threshold. It seems like the coral of this species at least have some kind of resistance to ocean acidification, acidification of the seawater. This kind of resistance um, uh, to the ocean acidification is not only found in the lab experiment, but also in the field, experiment, field measurements. Here I'm showing um, some data from my colleague Ann Cohen did at the Palo uh, Reefs. In this uh, region, you have a natural gradient of seawater pH. What they did is they extract a coral, scattered coral from different reef sites that have different uh, pH of seawater, which in turn means they have different saturation states. If uh, coral behave as an uh, air body experiment predicted, then you will see a decrease of classification rate. But in fact, when you look at the coral cores from these different sites, although they are omega, a decrease from three point something to two point something, you don't really see a significant decrease in the classification rate. So now this is a problem we are facing. If you trust the air binding experiment, you will predict we have a very uh, dramatic decrease in coral classification, but you don't really always see it in lab experiment or in reef measurements. So what, how to answer what's causing this kind of discrepancy here? This kind of difference makes it very hard to predict what's the future of coral reefs. So what I'm proposing is uh, to resolve, to answer this question, we need to go to the fundamentals, the basics, to understand how coral calcify. As uh, Andrea also kind of alluded in her talk, coral calcification doesn't really happen in the seawater. It happens in a calcified space that is separated from the seawater by tissue cells. And there has been plenty of evidence coral are actually regulate the carbon chemistry in this calcifying fluid, leading to a chemical environment that's very different from the external seawood. So this, uh, there has been quite a few measurements have been done trying to calculate what's the carbon chemistry in this calcifying fluid. What I'm showing here is just one very nice example from a Beijing Chinese group. There, they use the microelectrode uh, penetrate through the coral tissue and get a pH profile throughout from the seawater across the tissue. And you can see the pH uh, uh, recorded by the electrode actually stay quite stable and through the seawater, through the tissue until a certain point, they reach a very increased sunlight to about 0.4 uh, 
units higher than seawater, and this point is supposed to be the calcified fluid. This kind of uh, high pH uh, uh, characteristic of calcified fluid is not only observed by microelectrode measurements, but also by uh, pH sensitive dyes. People grow coral in seawater, then dye the seawater with the pH sensitive dyes. Then you can monitor what the calcified pH uh, is. It also has been confirmed from geochemical proxies. This is the kind of process you analyze what the chemical or acid composition of a coral skeleton. Then you can infer what's the pH when uh, this coral skeleton was precipitated. Basically, it's the pH of the calcified fluid. So this, uh, the fact that the coral can actively regulate their calcified fluid chemistry poses a question. If they can actively regulate, then does their OA really matter? Because it's not really respond directly to OA or uh, the seawater. They have the ability to make the calcified fluid more easy to uh, uh, precipitate aragonite or skeleton. So here what I did is I compiled uh, existing constraints on the pH of calcified fluid from geochemical proxies and then plot against the pH of seawater from which coral grow. As you can see, the geochemical proxy uh, confirm what microelectron measurements, the pH of calcified fluid is higher than the external pH. And in lab experiment, you generally see, uh, even though it's higher coral regulated, but you still see a correlation between the calcified fluid pH and the seawater pH. But as things get more complicated if you move to natural samples, you see a lot more variability as shown by these color samples. The open gray circles are lab experiment. So what does this mean? Does it mean if in lab experiment, coral still respond to seawater, but in the natural environment, it doesn't? In fact, this, uh, there has been like a more extensive experiment trying to express that question. Here I'm showing one uh, field of multiplication experiment where they uh, multiplicate the pH of a sealed on a seasonal scale, then trying to measure what's the pH of a calcium fluid over seasons. You see here, when, even though they uh, modulate the pH of a seawater by a, almost like 0.4 units, you don't see a clear trend in the calcified fluid of the corals. Instead, you see big variability, but the relative invariant calcified fluid pH. The opposite also has been shown in natural coral samples. Here is another example where uh, we have two coral cores extracted for a, a reef site. At this reef site, the external seawater pH doesn't vary that much. And if you believe uh, the lab experiment where uh, the relationship between the calcium fluid and the seawater pH determine the lab culture experiment, you would expect the, the calcium fluid pH to be very, very little, almost nothing. But in fact, when you analyze the coral cores, what you see is much bigger variability. It's an order of magnitude than what you expect from lab culture experiment. And it ha also, this kind of variability correlates with the temperature. In summer, you usually see a, you usually see a, a decrease of calcium fluid, even though external pH hasn't changed that much. So it seems like it's, uh, all this evidence uh, are telling us something more than see what the pH is controlling the calcium fluid chemistry and calcium fluid chemistry uh, pH. So this kind of decoupling between the calcium fluid pH and external seawater pH has raised a question about whether coral can adapt or climb to OA and whether the non-pH factors may like, uh, play a big role in modulating the OA impact on coral calcification. To address this question, again, we, I think we should go to the fundamentals. The basics to understand the mechanism of how coral calcify. There has been quite a few studies uh, uh, from the geochemical community trying to understand how coral calcify in order to understand different proxy in the coral skeleton. The general view now uh, in the geochemical model is there are four different process, major process that uh, coral use to regulate their internal calcifying fluid chemistry and precipitate skeleton. The first one is uh, by an enzyme called calcium ATPS. What that does is actually pumping hydrogen out of the calcifying fluid to outside this, uh, at the same time for every two uh, protons they pumped out, 
they per, uh, pump in to calcium. So essentially, what this enzyme does is actually pump and increase alkalinity and pH of calcified fluid, uh, creating a high pH and low PCO2 environment in the calcified fluid. And because of this high pH, low PCO2, you have a CO2 diffusing from the uh, outside into the calcified fluid, providing another source of carbon for calcification. Besides this, uh, uh, passive CO2 degassing has also been proposed. By, there might be some uh, bicarbonate transporters that can actually uh, transport bicarbonate ion from external environment to this calcified fluid, making uh, a calcified uh, fluid uh, more enriched in carbon, make it easier to calcify. The third uh, process that's important for coral calcification is the leakage or exchange of this calcium fluid with the seawater. So you basically, this calcium fluid is not totally co closed. It's a semi-closed system. You can think of kind of like a flow-through system. Then when the coral elevates the pH and the carbon ion concentration in the calcium fluid, you have calcium, calcium carbonate precipitation happens. So what I did is build on this kind of geochemical models and especially prioritize this uh, a key process in the coral calcification that uh, build a numeric model trying to simulate how coral calcification, uh, nuclear uh, regulation of the pH of internal chemistry works. The model has the input is basically is the external seawater environment because it takes seawater and modulates it. So that's your starting composition. Then there are three key parameters, uh, calcium uh, ATP pumping rate, which correspond to our, the first press, uh, uh, process I just mentioned, then a carbon flux across membrane, that's the carbon transport by passive degassing or active transport. The third one is exchange rate. Then I uh, model the ca uh, calcium carbonate precipitation just like an inorganic precipitation rate. Then we run models through a study state, we can generate a study state that calcifying flow the pH, and uh, we can compare this calcifying fluid pH generated from the model compared with the uh, experimental data we have. Well, we know the coral grow. We know, basically we know what's the pH of coral grow. We know what's the calcifying fluid pH is. Then we try to uh, optimize those three key parameters to match the data. Here I'm showing the model result comparison uh, for lab experiment and the, the, the a circle, the field of circle are lab experimental data and the dashed line is model output. You can see here, of course, we are fitting the model to this experiment, so you see a good agreement. But the key point to take away from here is uh, we can use this kind of model, explain this kind of, the trend between the external seawater pH and the calcifying for the pH in lab experiment. And I also want to point out another output from this model is the DIC concentration in the calcifying fluid. And the, it turns out the model also produces a DIC uh, estimation that agrees pretty well with the independent constraint, which supports our model capture the key process uh, during the coral calcification. Um, so the uh, nice thing about having a model is you can play with, you can. Uh, control some parameter and trying to partition the relative role of each parameter in controlling calcium fluid chemistry, such as pH or DIC. I'm not going to uh, go to the detail here, but just lay out the conclusion from this kind of model sensitivity test. It turns out the key parameters that are controlling coral calcifying fluid chemistry is the, especially pH, is the seawater buffering capacity. When you have a seawater with a high buffering capacity, the coral, even if they do the same amount of work, they will elevate the internal pH to a less extent. So that determines uh, how high your pH can go in the calcifying fluid. Then another parameter uh, that's controlling coral calcifying pH is the temperature. This kind can't come in as a surprise, but in, red, but in fact, it's because when you have a high temperature, the coral uh, the calcium company precipitation rate, the rate of connectives increases, which means you basically precipitate more, and that comes with a uh, side effect is you're lowering the pH of the calcium high fluid. So together, see what the buffering capacity and temperature plays the first order control and the 
calculus caused by fluid pH. And the physical, physiological regulations such as pumping, carbon transport, or exchange can vary the coral cast fine fluid pH by a certain amount, but based on our comparison with lab experiment and the natural samples, it seems like for most of us, coral samples we deal, we're dealing with, it doesn't really vary that much. So um, the one way to test whether our model really working is we uh, using the model parameter we fitted with lab experimental samples and trying to predict well, for a natural sample, if we give the model the temperature, pH, and DIC of the seawater of this natural sample grow, whether we can predict the, the pH of the calcifying fluid right. It turns out the model did a very good job. For example, here, this is the sample I showed you earlier where the, the growing uh, seawater with very little external seawater pH but a very big temperature change. Well, model basically reproduce the calcifying fluid chemistry, uh, pH variations. What that means is uh, we now have a model we can basically predict what's the calcifying fluid uh, chemistry, especially pHs in natural samples. So I hope I have convinced you so far when you talk about uh, OA impact on coral calcification, it is very important to consider the role of calcifying fluid chemistry. It's because coral calcification doesn't happen in the seawater directly, it is happening in the calcified fluid. And the calcified fluid chemistry basically dictates what's the rate that you will end up with, what's the coral, how, coral, how fast the coral will calcify. And one uh, important message uh, from uh, our model result is despite these uh, physiological regulations, external seawater chemistry also still play a big role in controlling the internal carb, uh, carb calcifying fluid chemistry. What that means is coral calcification should fill the OA. So if the coral calcifying fluid chemistry is so important, does that mean coral calcification will respond to internal uh, calcifying fluid saturation state? So here I'm showing you is uh, some uh, coral cores we collected from different reef sites that has a different seawater or omega. As you expected, uh, the calcifying rate of this coral core doesn't really correlate of the seawater uh, saturation state, which is not surprising to you now, I hope. But what's surprising is when we're using geochemical method to reconstruct what's the internal the calcifying fluid omega we still don't see, do not see any correlations. What does that mean? So, but when we look in more deeper into the data, what we see is even though calcification doesn't correlate with the internal saturation state, the density of the coral skeleton actually correlates quite well. This might count as a surprise, but in fact, it's not that surprising when we're considering how coral calcify. So here is just a very uh, simple diagram about this, what we call two-step coral growth model. So coral growth doesn't happen as uh, uniformly. It first uh, is grow upwards, extend to build the skeleton. Um, then the second step is the trying to fill the, fill the empty space, what we call a sickening. The first step is the material is laid down is very organic rich, which means it's highly biology controlled. They are not sensitive to your OA or external seawater chemistry. But the second step is uh, much less uh, organic uh, containing and uh, much sensitive to chemistry ch chemical changes. So built on um, this kind of uh, framework, we build another model about the coral skeletal growth. And there are several parameters that are important. It's the like extension rate, which controls how much time the coral spend on uh, sickening. Then we have temperature, because that controls the reaction kinetics. And we have seawater carbon chemistry, for the reason I mentioned in the first part of the talk, because they control the calcifying fluid chemistry. And we run, we calibrate this model with the coral cost. We know what's the growth condition. We know what's the density. Then we can predict what's the uh, density of a coral. And we tested with some coral cost 
from the field, we see a pretty good agreement between the measure density and our model predictive density. Once we have a model work, again, why we build a model is trying to predict. So if we are convinced the model is working, we couple our coral growth model with a global climate uh, models, uh, which predict what's a seawater change in the next uh, century. And the, the one prediction from this mod, uh, model is, oh, sorry. By the end of century, we would expect uh, around up to 20% decline in coral skeleton, which is a big deal when you're considering the storm damage to the coast area. So the second uh, take home message is coral skeleton growth is not a simple process, it's a two-step process, but with extension and densification, but only densification respond to ocean densification. And based on coral skeletal growth model, we predict around up to 20% decline in the coral skeleton. So essentially, we basically have done so far is building a new framework trying to predict how seawater changes will affect coral calcification. Especially, we build a link between the seawater chemistry and the calcifying fluid chemistry. We also distinguish the two components of calcification, density and extension. Compared to the traditional method, which is built on an empirical relationship between the seawater chemistry and the calcification rate, I think this kind of model gives you more confidence in the predictions. But there's one caveat. In our prediction, the seawater chemistry data we, we use is coming from a climate model, which is at this moment, I believe, is for open ocean mostly. And we know for reef system and in, for coastal system in general, the, the carbon chemistry are more complicated. So as here is one example where uh, the authors compile the reef PCU2 data for the past 20 years, and you see the PCU2 and the reef are a much steeper trend than what you see in the open ocean. So what I want to learn from what this workshop I get XD from you is how we can uh, predict and understand the reef water chemistry better. With that, uh, I'll end with a summary slide, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Nice talk, uh, but you didn't mention anything about symbiotic algae that grow with corals and the effects of their metabolism and response to light um, and how that would affect the calcifying fluid. Yep, so in our model, we don't explicitly model those kind of effects, but it's kind of embedded in the parameters we put in there. Mostly one is P, the pumping, calcifying, calcium ATP pumping, which is energy cost process. So if algae is an energy source for corals, then they have a place there. And another thing is the sea, which is a carbon transport. If you have a algae there, they can also affect what's the external CO2 concentration, that or the carbon concentration in the outside, that can also affect it. But we don't have any algorithm or equation there to describe this kind of effect yet. Who has the mic? I um, I'm at the back. You can't see me because it's really dark. Introduce um, yourself. Yeah, I'm Karen Stamiashkin from VIMS. Um, I was curious about the photosynthetic um, algae that are symbiotic with these, with these coral. You can't hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so the, symbi the symbiotic algae that are living with the coral, I was curious if they make like a local kind of OA, um, like protected area, like as they're photosynthesizing, releasing oxygen, are they changing the carbonate chemistry really locally around the corals? Um, I think they definitely change the chemistry, but uh, when we're talking about the calcification, as I mentioned uh, in the talk, it's a semi-closed system, so the algae is not directly in contact with the calcifying space. They are still separated by membranes, those kinds of uh, So you will have an effect somewhere up, above the calcifying space, then you need to transport all that effect will be translated to a calcifying fluid. We don't, so in principle, you can build a compartment model to model that part of the 
chemistry, the PCO2 or pH, then see how it's affecting it. I don't see any experimental data showing that yet, 